Oh, take two. Welcome all to uh, day two of Ignite. I'm uh, going to be talking about what's new for Windows 10 for us app developers in the new anniversary edition and a bit about some of the versions before as well, just to kind of cover off a few of the changes. So there's been a term that's kind of bandied around since Windows 10 launched, and that's sort of Windows as a service. Uh, if you ask about five different people what this means, you'll probably get about five different answers. Uh, there's been no real clear definition of kind of what this is as an idea or a term, but I think we'll just talk about like what I think of it and what, what seems to be the case. So when this kind of term came out, people got started getting scared that they were going to be paying 30, 40 bucks a month for Windows, panicked, oh my god, it's software as a service, etc. But it seems to be more about greenfield. You know, the idea that we can always have a greenfield version of Windows on our machine, which is quite nice. It means us as app developers can start to care a little less about supporting earlier versions or making sure that it still works, but we're going to have a better chance of a larger market share holding a, a higher version of Windows. Uh, a good way to think about this is Chrome, right? What, what version of Chrome are you guys running at home? You stop caring, right? I think it's Chrome 54. I only know this because um, like a website I'm working on right now had a bug in Chrome 54. But other than that, you don't really care about what version of Chrome you're running. And that's going to hopefully be the case with Windows. We're going to see more and more updates come out, mostly on a six monthly basis. It seems to be so far. And these versions are going to add more features to both the sort of the platform for us as app developers, but just the UI in general for, for users. So we've seen three major releases so far to Windows. We've seen the release, obviously. This was uh, last year sometime. Uh, the November update, which, funny enough, came in November. And the anniversary update, which came in about August this year. Now, there's two numbers tied to every release of Windows. The, uh, the first one there on the left is the, the version number. Uh, and the second one is the OS build number. Now, I kind of have them both up there because different parts of the Windows documentation talks about these two numbers independently. Sometimes I'll say, hey, you need you know, 1511 of Windows to run, run this sample or run this uh, bit of functionality. And other times they'll mention 14393. So the way I think about it, higher number is the OS build, lower number is the version number. And if you want to actually check which version you're on, you just use About My PC, which I'll show you in a minute. So my name's Nigel Sampson. Uh, I'm an engineer at Pushpay here in Auckland. I'm the uh, project lead on an MVVM framework called Calibre Micro, uh, which is a sort of a cross-platform framework for building apps. Uh, we won't really cover that much in this talk. And I'm a Microsoft MVP in Windows platform development. You can catch me on GitHub and Twitter at those links. So I'm going to make this talk mostly demo, because demos are cool. We're here to see what we can build with apps on Windows 10, so let's see all the demos. So the first thing, whenever we're going to build something like a new app on Windows, we need to work out, can the features, we, what we want to use, are these new cool shiny toys available to us as app developers? We need to find out, you know, does the current platform support what we want? And if we did this in a rather silly way, we could check, you know, what version of, you know, what OS build number, what version of Windows 10 am I running, therefore does this version support the functionality I want? And that way lies madness. That way lies pain about having to remember which features are supported on which build numbers, which maybe if you're on a different platform like Xbox or HoloLens, is it a different build number to support the same functionality? And you're just going to drive yourself insane. If you need to do your web dev back in uh, the olden days before jQuery, you ever having to remember doing browser detection, am I running a Netscape Navigator 4, am I an IE, oh my god, this is a pain, and jQuery came along and saved all our lives. Now this answer has been around in JavaScript for quite a while, it's around sort of feature detection, right? We shouldn't care about what version of Windows or what platform we're running on, we should always just care about, is the thing I want available? And we can always do this through a class called API information in the uh, system foundation metadata namespace. And API information 
has a lot of awesome types. Sorry, the IntelliSense can't blow that one up. But basically, it has a whole lot of methods like is event present, is type present, is contract present. And this lets us say, hey, is the thing I want available on the platform I'm running? Because later on, it, like for instance, you may be looking at something with, in this case, uh, my test here has, is the type hardware buttons available? I, can I listen to hardware camera pressed or hardware back pressed? Well, you know, right now that might not be available on this laptop, but there's nothing saying that a tablet down the road couldn't come with a hardware back button. So what, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about the framework or the version. We just need to know, hey, does this build support a hardware back button? Yes, it does. Yay, light up some functionality. Now, it can get complex about working out which things you want to look at and support. So whenever you're on MSDN and you're looking at a class like this, right at the bottom you'll see this little grid. Basically says this came in in the mobile device family in version one and it's supported in the Windows phone phone contract. So you can either look for the hardware buttons namespace actual type or you can say is the contract Windows phone dot phone contract supported. Either way, if, if either of those return true, then yep, you can use hardware back buttons. So it's good always, if, you, if you're doing sort of cutting edge stuff, always check to see whether this stuff's available to you. And if you look at something like, let's look at camera event args, jump down here, actually it's the same one. Actually we'll just look for something really simple. Something like text box is just going to be in the universal contract. Universal contract means you know, it's available everywhere, but it might not be available everywhere on every platform because it might be universal contract, say, version three. And the, essentially the universal contract version three corresponds to what stuff has come in anniversary edition. So we can test that pretty easily by doing the same thing. Is the contract present Windows Foundation universal API contract V3? That basically means that anything that came in the Windows 10 Anniversary Edition and is supported under that contract is now available to me, et cetera. So now you can build apps that are supported all the way back to the first version of Windows 10. And then if the, the app user has a higher version of Windows, then more functionality lights up and you can make use of the cool new stuff we hope to show off today. But you can still support older things. You can obviously do this pretty easily by, if we look at the project features, uh, sorry, project properties. We have our target. I'm targeting universal Windows, so this, this app should run everywhere, HoloLens, IoT, Xbox, the phone. Target version, I'm actually targeting Windows Anniversary and Min Windows Anniversary. If I wanted to say support this back to an earlier version, I can just drop this down to, see here, in this case we're using the uh, OS build number, not the OS version number in this list, yay. Uh, but so if I can select here, it basically says this should run on release edition Windows 10 all the way up to anniversary edition. But at that point I'd have to start doing some platform detection, otherwise bad things will happen. So the first thing that came along, um, I find some of the more interesting things is around compiled bindings. So who's heard of compiled bindings in Windows 10? Cool. Okay, so if you've done any data binding before, it's basically reflection based. You type in a property name, you say, I wanna bind onto my view model from this property onto something in my UI. And under the covers, the binding stuff uses reflection, finds that property, hooks up noti property notifications, and does it the way through. <coughs> That's, that can be slow. If you've got thousands of bindings on your screen at any one time, that's gonna slow you down. And when the Office team at Microsoft decided to rebuild Office on top of UWP, you know, bindings were too slow for them. So they came back to the, the Windows team and said, no, we need something better. In this case, they, wanted, they came back with compiled bindings. So we'll show what this looks like. So I've quickly got a, a screen with a score. I can lower my score. I can increase my score, and when I get above 10, I get a high score. Yay, nothing particularly crazy. My view model for this looks 
really simple. I have account property, which is form notify property changed for itself as well as high score. High score is just return, returning a Boolean if my score is over 10. And I have two methods, increment and decrement, which increase the count and decrease the count. If you haven't played with C-sharp 6 syntax, that's the, new, that's the stuff down the bottom there where we're using expression bodies for members and properties. It's really cool, makes your code a lot simpler. Highly recommend it. In the UI layer is where all this, the cool stuff comes in. So our text box, first thing we need to know is that we can't just bind to a sort of arbitrary data context anymore, right? The, the data context in uh, all our XAML frameworks has always just been an object, <coughs> which means it's not strongly typed. We need something strongly typed to bind to for, for compiled bindings. So in this case, I've just created a, a view model property, which basically just returns the data context as a strongly typed view model. From there, my text box, I'm binding x bind instead of just binding. So it's just simply just to change an x to x bind to view model dot count, and mode is one way. By default, for comp uh, for compiled bindings, the mode is one time. So we want to set one way for this because the count is going to change. We want to update the UI to reflect that. Below, I've got buttons. And I'm actually X-binding the event, which is something new that came in, I think, the last version of Windows 10, but not in this, uh, not in anniversary edition. But it's still something worth to note. You can now X-bind methods or events in the UI to methods in your view model, just by saying X-bind to method, and we're done. The last next two are pretty cool. So back in my code behind, I have a method called format. If the value is greater than 10, return high score, otherwise return low score. In my xbind expression, I can call that format method passing in viewmodel.count. And as viewmodel.count gets changed, it'll recall that method, get the string, put it into the text block. And that's all handled under the covers. So none of this is particularly new for binding. <coughs> you could do this with something like a value converter, but now we've just got a simple method, so it, we can speed things up. And new in the anniversary edition is that high score, remember, is a Boolean. I'm binding this to a visibility. Before we had to have silly Boolean to visibility converters and all that sort of piping and shenanigans. With compiled bindings, we don't have to. It basically implicitly converts that Boolean into a visibility, and life is good. Now, what does this do under the covers? You know, why is, how is this different than bindings? Well, oh, that's not what I want, it's that one. When we build this code, we generate some stuff at run time, at compile time. I'm just gonna find it now. Sorry, it'll be under views. We have these generated files. And it's in the .g.cs. So under the covers here, we can see a whole lot of code that ends up doing our work. So if we just search for format, so here, it's generating code to call, get our count, call format, and put it into the right appropriate place. So it's generating all the code that does all that kind of reflection and, and all that work at compile time. So it doesn't have to do it at runtime with reflection and bindings, it can do all that work right at compile time with strong types, which means if you're binding a, a string to a integer, it's gonna complain. You might have to do some work to manipulate that through the methods, but it means that a, your bindings are type safe, and it means that you'll get compile errors if things aren't going right, because there's nothing worse than creating a whole data binding system and then you know, loading it up, getting to the right page, and it's not working, and you have no idea why. Compiled bindings will solve this for you, which is great. So if you can use them, I say go ahead and do so. The next part, media. So 
There used to be a, a player toolkit control that was pretty good. Uh, we had to bring it in for any framework we wanted to use. The media element, media player element has come along and it solves almost all our problems for us, which is fantastic. It's got built-in things for, for aspect ratio, for casting to other devices, for full screen, etc. We don't have to do anything now, which I think is awesome. Let's close that. Um, and the other great thing is that it has built-in support for the system transport controls. So before you needed to do a whole lot of wiring yourself around, hey, did the, is this system transport controls? Did they hit the play button? Did they hit the pause button? Now we get it all for free. So I'm just hitting the play button on my keyboard, starts the media, pause the media, all for free, which is great. And below, this is gonna sound really silly, but it's kind of useful. We've got animated GIFs. Yay, I can build my meme generator. They're out of the box now with play and pause methods and the like, which is fantastic. It's, it's just built in. Um, it seems really silly, but you can do a lot of really interesting things with animated GIFs in terms of just simple presentation and so on when, when something like a, a media element and a video is just a bit too much. So how does this look? We simply have a media player element. I say, are transport controls enabled true? Which basically means that should there be a play and pause button? And that's about it, we're done. I'm sitting with some source in the code behind. Basically creating a new, new media player object, setting the media elements media player, and then setting the source to my, my video. For the animated GIF, I have an image element, sourced to a bitmap image bound to my example GIF, and I've set autoplay to false. I've xnamed the GIF so that I can call play and stop on my GIF. That's it, nice and easy. Some new control changes. Uh, some really nice simple one is the, t the combo box at the top. We now get so I've just got my list of numbers. Type ahead support out of the box. I mean, previously we had to get this stuff kind of uh, from third party frameworks, uh, but now nice and easy. Now, I've just got messages scrolling in here. They're all hopefully lower mipsum. Uh, one of the new things, if you're building chat apps or anything around that kind of new conversational UI, which you might be doing now with a new bot framework, is that keeping, when new messages pop to the bottom, keeping that stack panel or that scroll view scrolled to the bottom was always just a real pain. So that comes now out of the box, it's just a property on the stack panel to say, when new stuff comes in, just keep scrolled to the bottom. So we can see this conversational UI from a bot framework, just scrolling in. We get some simple stuff around the app bar at the bottom, which now supports overflow. So as the screen gets smaller, buttons overflow into the secondary stuff, which makes supporting, you know, an app panel or an app that supports you know, big and small screen, quite a bit simpler. Now, on desktop, you know, if you're building a desktop app, people are used to things like keyboard shortcuts. They're used to being able to hit control save, alt s, whatever. You know, if they're used to office, you know, the key cords to get to different parts of the ribbon. Well, you know, well, we want that too. So, it's a bit hard to support there, but just hit alt now, and we can see some shortcuts around. If I hit O, I hit invoke that functionality, etc. Let's jump off to something else for a second. Get that. Cool. Now that's supported. We'll go see how all this stuff is done. So for the app bar, we don't have to do anything. It comes out of the box, which is great. Our combo box, we don't actually have to do anything either. It just happens. If you don't want it, there's a property to disable it if you need to. But I can't see why you would. For the list view, for our, sorry, for our stack panel, 
we have a new property on the item stack panel called items updating scroll mode. And I've just set that to keep last item in view. So that way as new stuff comes in, we keep the last, new last item in view and away we go. And that has obviously some different options for different things around keeping the scroll offset and the normal behavior. The last thing was that access keys. So this is called access keys, obviously, in um, Windows 10. So I have an access key set to O for my app button here, for P for this one, and N down here. Now, when it's on a control, it kind of does what you'd think, right? So if you apply an access key to a button and someone hits Alt, that letter, then the button's click event's going to be uh, invoked. It's going to do kind of what you expect. For the combo box here, it basically just focuses on that combo box. You know, kind of, I think what you'd expect, but you can always change this, which is pretty cool. So, what I've done, also, but that, the other part to this was the, uh, the tooltips. That doesn't come out of the box. So, there's some really simple code you can do this though. I have a behavior here called access key tooltip. I'm listening to two events when I attach the access key display requested and dismissed. Just attaching to those events. And when the display is requested, I create a tooltip, make it look good, set the content to be the access key, and then set it as a tooltip for my control. And when the display is dismissed, I basically close the tooltip. Done. So what that looks like, obviously when I hit Alt, on every control where there's an access key set, that access key display requested is fired. I can do whatever I need to, in this case show a tooltip. When I hit O, it invokes the click event on that app bar button, and then calls access key dismissed on all the other elements to dismiss those. So you can do whatever you want here in terms of like you know UI to make it highlight what things should be done. And obviously for that combo box, just to see, there is an, also an access key invoked event. So if you want to do something special that's not the kind of the default behavior for that control, just attach yourself to the access, con access key invoked event. Background tasks, who's written background tasks for apps before? Who actually enjoyed it? The background tasks in, in Windows 10 are amazing in terms of their, their power. Because they were built, you build them as separate WinMD modules and they are hosted in a separate process, it means that if you have something running in the background, it can spin up a very lightweight process to do that work for you. It doesn't have to invoke your entire application um, but with great power came great pain. If you were trying to do anything like almost like mutex behavior, if you were trying to sync, sync stuff down from the cloud in a background task while the app was running and you wanted to make sure that you were trying to coordinate work between your app and the background task, it became very painful very quickly. You could do some really, very, I want to say sort of rudimentary messaging between the two by using like the app settings because both the background task process and your app process had access to app settings. You could kind of pass messages between the two, but it wasn't particularly uh, strongly typed. You kind of had strings going back and forth and hope for the best. What's come along in Windows 10 Anniversary Edition is the, this idea of a single process background task. So that means you can run the background task or you can set them up to run in the same process as your application. So if your application's already running, it just runs it in that, that process that's already there. If your application's not running, it basically spins up your entire application without a UI and runs that, runs that background task. This does come with some performance problems or performance costs. You know, if you've got a huge app that has a lot of assets, then it's gonna take longer to load, which means if you're on a phone or some, some other device which is a bit more hardware constrained, maybe like a HoloLens, then Chewing battery life just to save yourself some dev time may not be the right thing to do. Obviously this doesn't have much of an example, but we can look at the code. So the code is very much the same 
as you would do with a normal background task. We check to see whether, the, whether it's already been registered by looking at the existing registrations, and if it's already there, you skip out. Otherwise, we create a background task builder, set the task name, set the trigger, call register, and we're done. We don't have to do it. What's important here is we're not setting the source. So previously, when you were creating a background task, you had to register the, the source or the type, like where was the WinMD module that you referenced that contains this background task. In this case, we're not doing any of that. We're just saying, I want a background task that runs every 15 minutes. Go. What happens then when it's executed is that instead of calling a type in a, another assembly, it simply calls into your background calls into your application, into a new method called on background activated. So here we get our normal, much the same you would get as kind of that method in a normal background task where we can say, get our task instance. So if you've got multiple tasks here, you've got multiple background tasks registered, you're gonna have to do some work to say, hey, which one based off task instance Maybe, <laughs> the instance, the actual task. Get all IntelliSense. Task name, to work out, hey, which one's been invoked, what work should I do? And just the same as the other background tasks, or anything that involves asynchrony, you need to do deferrals. So what's basically happening here is you're getting a deferral out of the task instance, you're doing your work, potentially asynchronous, and then you say deferral complete. Because if you're doing asynchronous work and you don't do a deferral, what's gonna happen is you're gonna come out, basically fall off the end of this method. Windows 10's gonna think, hey, you finished your background task and maybe kill the process because that was running in the background. So when you're using asynchrony, always use deferrals. Web to app links. So these are a quite a cool feature for more public facing. Uh, you, know, you almost even enterprise as well. If you've, if you've got specialized apps that are taking over parts of what your website or your web app used to do, you can now hijack what call it, the HTTP links to websites into your app. Previously with Windows 10, if you wanted something to be able to launch your application, it was via custom protocols, you know, my app colon slash slash something or handling um, file um, uh, protocol, file, sorry, file handlers like dot, doc, x, dot, text, etc. What we can do now is say, I want to handle things going to certain websites. Instead of opening the website, open my app instead. So op if I click open google.com, we just get to the website. Click open compiledexperience.com, which is my website, and we get a choice. Do I want to open this in Chrome, or do I want to open this in my app? And if I click my app, then we get to a new page in the app itself. So this is real. It takes a bit of kind of messing around to set this up, mostly because you know Microsoft. I want to make sure you hijack Google.com, so everything that clicks Google goes to your app, because that would be immoral. So the way this works, the way you set this up, is in your package manifest. And you set a new, new app extension and say, app URI handler for compiledexperience.com. If you want to handle, say, dub, dub, dub as well, then that's another URI handler as well. Uh, but you can do wildcards. So now you've said, all right, my app handles compiledexperience.com. That's not enough, because I could say google.com here, microsoft.com, and Away we go. What you need then is a JSON file, which looks a bit like this, Windows app web link. And you basically put your package family name in there. You'll get the prop, this one's just the one from my manifest right now. Once you've registered your app with the store, then you'll get the actual package family name, which you can just pull out of your manifest. Stick that in here, stick which paths you want to handle. You might not want to handle every web link that goes to the website. You might, in this case, I've said handle everything, star, except for blog. Blog links should go to the website. Everything else should go to the app. Once you've got this file, 
you upload it to your website. At, you know, so when it goes to compilexperience.com slash Windows app web link JSON, it gets this file. That way Microsoft can verify you have ownership of that file and it can start to determine behavior. If you want to change this file, you just need to ch change, you know, ch make changes, upload it to the website, and in around about sort of five to 10 days, those changes will make their way to the app in terms of behavior. So that's nice and simple. To see, actually see like that code to launch the app, we're simply just using the launcher.launch URI for the two different URLs, and Windows is taking the work from there. This works from anywhere, so if they're clicking links uh, in other applications and they use Launcher, they'll, they'll come to yours as well. Inking. So inking was a pretty big feature announced in some of the Windows 10 stuff. Inking's been around for a while and the amount of pens, devices with pen sales is increasing quite a bit. So it's quite a cool thing. Part of what came out of Windows 10 for consumers is this ink ink workspace. So here I can have a sketch pad, I can sketch on the screen. Oop, that's not a very nice color. Let's go with something bigger. Yeah. And we can e easily make an attachment. So that's built in. I want something like, how can I build this sort of support into my app? You know, if I'm on a surface, you know, they've got pen, they've got finger, they've got touch, etc. You know, let's support some inking stuff in there. So I have a quick, a really quick ink toolbar. And if I click, nothing happens because I'm not supporting touch. Click a button here, support touch. Away we go. And I get a ruler built in. So I can sit here, turn that around, draw a line, spin that that way, draw another line, dismiss the ruler. All built into the app with no real work. I can also do things like save my ink. And reopen it. It just seems to have broken. Yay. Okay, let's look at this. The first thing I declare, I'm not sure why IntelliSense isn't liking this, is my ink canvas, which is really small. Simply ink canvas, done. The next part I'm declaring is my ink toolbar. And the first thing I do is bind the toolbar to the canvas. And I've set initial controls none. So if you don't set this, you'll get the default controls, which is basically a pen, a pencil, a razor, and a ruler, and that's it. That's cool, if that's all you need, you've kind of done at that point. I wanna have a bit more custom control about what I'm doing in terms of my pens. So I've turned that off, and then I'll just close those resources for a second. But I've added back in the ballpoint pen, the pencil, a custom pen, the eraser, a ruler, and a toggle button. The custom toggle button, which is just invoking some stuff down the bottom, is simply enabling my touch. So that's here, where I'm setting the input devices to either pen and touch or pen. This is how I'm clicking a button and saying, oh, hey, I want better touch on the sync canvas. The other cool thing is you can really build really simple pens really quickly. So this custom pen I built, simply inherits from ink bar custom pen. So this is a sort of a calli uh, calligraphic pen. So what's happening is I'm creating a circle for my pen tip. Um, I'm sending it to the brush, so I'm letting the people out pick which color they pick. And down here, I'm setting the size to be twice the height as the width. So now I've got a kind of like an oval shape for my pen. And I'm rotating it 45 degrees. So now my pen is essentially a kind of a slight oval on a curve, which gives us that nice, nice effect. And that's it, that's all I have to do. Create this pen, and then back in here, I create my custom pen button, set custom pen to my new pen, 
set my palette, in this case, to uh, the resources I've got here, which is basically just a brush collection. So I've got my custom palette. And I'm setting some stuff like max stroke width, etc. So now I've got really simple control over pens, over uh, anything I want. And you can do some more interesting things as well. This is kind of like a really high level overview. And here I've got code for basically loading and saving the inks, ink strokes out of that canvas to a file. You can load them up later, maybe store them in the cloud, share them, do whatever you want. Now, this is kind of like a really, really high level. Uh, there is a wealth of functionality with regards to inking in the platform. So I'd recommend, if you're interested in any of this stuff, go check out the actual, the full examples from Microsoft. They have about 30 or 40 just relating to inking. Uh, it can really help you along. Let's go to the next example, eventually. Effects. Um, who's heard of the composition thread in Windows? Cool. So we all know about the UI thread, right? We know there is a, a thread that's responsible for kind of arranging and drawing our user interface. And we should not do things on this UI thread because the more stuff we do on that UI thread, then the less time Windows has to draw and do things. So if we do something that's really hardcore on that thread, then our frames per second for stuff like list scrolling goes down, our UI looks terrible, and we don't get any reviews. I mean, good reviews at least. Now, come about Windows Phone 7.5, when uh, Microsoft added something called the composition thread. So what this is, is the UI thread does all the work around laying out your user interface, doing a full layout pass, it does a measure, it does an arrange, and works out what size everything should be, and tells each of those elements on the screen to render themselves as visuals. The composition thread then takes over. It takes those visuals, it arranges them on the screen, and then tells them, hands it off to DirectX, and DirectX renders them onto your screen and all as well. What's really useful here is that certain pieces of functionality only affect the composition thread. And the reason this was added was fast list scroll speed. If you were scrolling really, 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 really quickly on a, on a list view, then the UI layer or the UI thread didn't need to do much work. It needed to do measure and arranging for the stuff coming onto the screen, but that was it. The composition thread just needed to take the visuals it already had and shift them up slightly. It didn't need to do full layout passes. It could just rearrange things on the composition thread and you'd get blazingly fast UI. If you've done animations before in Windows 10 or actually even in Windows 8 or uh, Windows Phone and know the idea about dependent animations versus independent animations, independent animations are the ones that didn't touch the UI thread. They only touched the composition thread and therefore were blazingly fast. So if you needed to do stuff around opacity, uh, scale, rotation, these things didn't cause layout parses. All they caused was something like the visual that was already there to be rotated or its opacity changed, and therefore was really quick. So this, this composition thread's been around for quite a while now, uh, but we really couldn't touch it beyond stuff like knowing if we did certain things, we could avoid the UI thread and just use the composition thread. But then Microsoft and Windows 10 decided, well, we've got this really cool, cool idea that's under the covers. Let's expose some of that functionality to us as developers and let us actually mess around with that composition thread. Now, it's been there for a long time. Uh, and actually, even a lot of this functionality is available from Windows 10 itself. So I'm just going to talk about the new things in Anniversary Edition. But there is a wealth of things you can do. And I recommend looking at Windows UI Dev Labs. Has basically every sample you could want around messing with this, this, this thread itself. So if we look at the samples quickly here. 14393. 
we get stuff, you know, you can do uh, shadows, you can do, uh, you know, those cool animations where, you know, as you scroll, the image changes and scrolls in relation to it, etc. That's all stuff that can happen on the composition thread really easily. So in this case, for my effect here, I just have a, an image and I can blur it nice and easily. Previously, that would have been really difficult. But now everyone kind of looks and goes, wow, that's nice and easy. So let's take a look really quickly. So all this work happens on something called a compositor. I'm getting the compositor for my screen, so I'm just saying get element visual for this, and then getting compositor. So get element visual basically returns that visual that the composition thread works with for any UI element on the screen. And then you can start to mess with it. And I just want the compositor for the element for the screen. I create a blur, and I'm setting a composition source parameter, which lets me, uh, you know, pipe in what we want to change, set the blur amount, and away we go. Just skip down here a bit. I create an effect factory for that blur, and I say I want to be able to change the blurs, the blur's blur amount by sort of external access, you know, through that slider. Create a backdrop brush, which basically is a way to mess with the the, uh, the UI itself. Set the source parameter to that backdrop. Create a sprite, which is set to that brush, and the size is the, uh, the image, width and height, and then set that visual as a child of the element. So basically putting that visual that I'm creating over top of that image, and then messing with it. And then down the bottom, when my sc sc uh, scroll bar changes, I'm just changing the blur amount. Nice and simple. And I've got a custom here, one where you can miss, combine these together. So here I've created a blend effect with a foreground being a color source and the background being that blur. So if I change the effect factory to use the blend rather than the blur, then we're essentially we're creating some color out of nowhere. In this case, it's a bit of a light gray with some opacity. Putting that, oh, actually some blue, sorry. Putting that over top of the image uh, in a combined effect with the blur. So doing things like drop shadows and effects is all really this simple. You're just kind of hijacking that composition thread and adding DirectX sort of effects on top of that, which is quite cool. Now you can, always, you can animate all of this stuff as well. So if you want to animate the visuals or the blur or anything like that, that's no worries. But what came in Windows 10 Anniversary Edition was this thing called implicit animations. So if you think about it, everything that the UI thread does in terms of measurements and arranging ultimately, ultimately affects something in the visual. So if we change its position, its, you know, its height, its width, uh, its x, y coordinates, whatever, then it changes the visual's offset. What we can do is attach animations to those visuals and say, hey, when this offset changes, animate it. That's it. So what it means is we get like cool effects like this. As my size changes, I get you know, animated position changes. And that's nothing special to the list view. This is basically saying that whenever any element visual changes its position, change, animate its opacity, animate it moving, done. We don't need to kind of do anything special for this. So I'll show you what this looks like. So our, my grid view, to explain these colors, has nothing in it, right? Nothing regarding animations. It's simply got the item template to show that color, and we're hooking into the container content changing. This is basically like, when is a new list view created? So the first thing we're gonna do is create, we have this thing called an implicit animation collection. So this is gonna be the animations I wanna to apply to every element. So when the, the screen starts up, we're gonna create this collection. We're gonna get our compositor again, 
and we're going to create a vector three key animation. And we're going to say we're going to animate the offset, which is essentially the XY position on screen. We're going to create one keyframe that says at the end of the animation, we should be at the final value. So this is where the UI thread says I should be. And I want this to happen over 800 milliseconds. I then create another scalar animation. I'm targeting the visual's opacity this time. And I'm saying at 0 0.2 of the time, so 0 0.2 of 800 milliseconds, the, the opacity should be at 0.5, so half see-through. At 0.8 of the time, it should be at half see-through. And then at full time, it should be at the final value. So what that means is it animates in, quickly animates in, in a couple of hundred milliseconds into half, stays half for most of the portion, then animates back up to the final value at the end. So that's how we get that really nice, really simple kind of fade, then come back in, fade, come back in. Recreate an animation group, adding the offset animation and the uh, opacity animation. And then we create an implicit animation collection, which is actually a dictionary, which makes things a little more awkward. But we're basically saying when the offset changes, so when the XY position on screen changes, run this animation group. That's what we, now, we now have our implicit animation collection. And the last part here is when one of those new list view items are created, set the implicit animations to be that collection, and we're done. So every element in your, on your screen can be converted into a visual through this get element visual. Every visual has an implicit animations collection, so any element on your screen can have these implicit animations tied to it, which means once you've set them up, you kind of fire and forget. As, they, as the element moves around screen, it'll have its kind of changes animated for you, which I think is quite nice. The last part, which kind of builds on top of implicit animations, is connected animations. So who's done those, tried to build those UI sort of interactions where you're on one screen, user interacts, taps something, goes on to another screen, but you want a cool sort of flow through animation to try and keep the user's eye going around, you know, transitions from one screen to another. Something that looks a bit like that, right? So if this was more content, etc then you know, we're seeing that transition from one screen to the next really easily. So this is two separate XAML UIs. So if we quickly look at this, we see in one screen uh, a grid with an image and a text block. Uh, this one's set quite small with 240. And then in animations target, we have another UI completely separate, but just laid out differently. So the way this works, so when we're clicking the button in, on the first screen, we ask for the connected animation service for the current view. And we say, I want to animate with the name wallpaper my image. And I want to, anim and I want to animate the text with this element. So basically, I'm just tying two XAML elements to a string, in this case which is the key of the animation, and then say, go to the next page. In the UI for the next page, I'm getting the uh, connected animation service again. I'm getting those animations based on those strings I used, and I'm tying them to elements on the new screen. So I'm saying, start an animation on the old screen tied to this image, all right, on the new screen, get that image typed, get that animation typed to the new image. I'm not saying how it should be animated, how long, or anything like that. I can mess with it, that if I want, I can say, oh, I can mess around with the speeds in here, etc. but I don't really want to. The important thing is, I'm not doing anything really complex here. I'm just saying, image, image, animate the two. And that visual layer works out, that composition thread works out the difference and animates between the two. So that's how we get our nice shift animation, etc. 
which means it's really easy if you want to do those whole list UIs where the thing flies out and up to the top of the screen, etc. those reveal animations. It's nice and simple. So the last thing I want to talk about is Xbox. So I'm not going to talk into this too much detail. Uh, Damien Carson here is going to be talking about Xbox at greater length later on than me in another talk. So I highly recommend that one. I just want to talk about a couple of new features because this doesn't, as well as Xbox, if you're say building a, uh, an app that's going to be on an IoT device that has a gamepad as an input, these things are still relevant or you, for some reason the person has a, a gamepad plugged into their PC. So the more interesting things here for us kind of app developers are things like focus and sound. So if we look at here, we have things like X, XY focus left, XY focus right, and so on. So this allows us to give sort of visual hints that if they are interacting with a gamepad, you know, when they hit left or right and they've got a button focused, which one should it go to? The platform tries to make some kind of guesses you know, that if you hit uh, left here, it should go to three, because it kind of sort of goes, okay, well, you should go over to three. Let's, but sometimes this, the, the implicit stuff from Xbox might not, what, might not what be what you want, sorry. And so therefore you can kind of tweak those sort of focus directions. The other thing is also to sound. Yeah, hey, look, I've got Xbox sounds. It's all built into the platform. Nice and easy, right? Uh, what Windows does is detects, are you running on a platform where sounds make sense? If so, it's enabled by default, but we can change that if we want. So the way that looks really simply is using the element sound player, we just set its state to be either on or off. Uh, auto is what you use to um, basically do platform detection and we can also just do custom sounds in this case we were just saying element sound player play the invoke sound um, if you're building any sort of custom elements where you're building a full custom control then you might need to invoke these sounds yourself so that's kind of like the, the roundup of what's kind of new for us as app developers. But there's some stuff I want to talk about that I can't really cover in demos. So the first thing is installing an AppX. Previously, if you wanted to get an AppX to maybe your developers, your testers, uh, a client for sort of sign up, et cetera, you handed in this AppX along with some PowerShell scripts and a signature and then you had to explain to a client what a PowerShell was and how to invoke it, and it was just painful. In Anniversary Edition, the Apex is just a double click to install, as long as, it, as long as it's signed. So life is well, life is good. If you're wanting to get an app quickly into the store and you've already got WPF, the desktop app converters finally uh, have been released and able to be used. So what this does is it's a tool from Microsoft that takes an MSI, you install the MSI, and it keeps track of what, you, what that installer does. <coughs> Sorry. And then creates uh, an AppX that you can install into the store itself. These uh, desktop apps can then make use of the UWP, these Windows 10 APIs, and can uh, slowly sort of merge their way and converge to becoming a full universal app. The Windows Store for Business has been released. I believe it's in New Zealand now. Um, and this allows for businesses sort of volume acquire apps to say, hey, we've got 100 developers. I need 100 copies of your app. I'll download them and then or buy them and then distribute them to people within their organization who need them. And if someone uh, leaves the company, they can revoke that license and use the, give that app to someone else to use. So it enables businesses to, to better deal with volumes of apps. It also means that you, if you have um, building an app for a client directly that's a business, then they can sort of manage that app themselves in their store without going through the major store. 
So with Windows 10 also came deployment to Xbox One, which Damien here can talk about more. Basically, there is a dev mode activation app on the Xbox One. You can download it. Uh, it's for, uh, for free. Flick a button that turns your, puts your Xbox into dev mode. At that point, you can deploy straight your apps from your machine straight to your Xbox and do some testing. You have to switch it back off dev mode if you want to start playing games, though. The HoloLens emulator is sort of generally available. I won't talk about it too much. There's quite a few HoloLens talks uh, upcoming in this conference. But basically, you get an emulator you can play with locally. Uh, it's a good thing to do because there are some really interesting things around the, the app model in HoloLens, even if you're just building a 2D uh, application. Uh, you have this idea that you can pin your app to multiple rooms in your house, right? The way this works is they're just secondary tiles. If you've done any work with uh, apps and tiles, you know that you, know, you have secondary tiles in your app. They can invoke, and you might want to go different places. Well, that's how kind of HoloLens builds and HoloLens works with regards to that. Project Rome, that came out, it's come out now. It's also called uh, Connected Applications. What this is, is a way for you to build, you remember the, the Xbox Smart Glass, that style stuff, where you have like a main app running on one machine, but you might have a companion app running on a different device. You can build them yourself using the cloud to talk to each other, um, but you ended up having to do a lot more infrastructure yourself. What Project Roma allows you to do is basically call up, start up a service, connect to different applications, say, are there any other applications of mine running in my network? Are they running on Xbox? Oh, good. I should be able to do this to it. And you can pass messages between your applications on the local network without having to worry about the cloud or messaging and other sort of infrastructure stuff, which is quite nice. Uh, with the Xbox, means we have support for new inputs like steering wheels, arcade sticks, et cetera, with force feedback. They're available on every platform, not just Xbox. So if you want, you're building an IoT thing that uses a steering wheel, you can go ahead and do that pretty easily. Applications can have their own ecosystem. What this means is that because apps like uh, Edge, Microsoft Edge, are built on top of UWP, you get some interesting things like you know, what they need for, to build for that, you can now do in your app. So you can have extensions to your application in the store that people buy and download and extend functionality in your app. So you can use the Windows application model app extensions namespace and have a play. Because we're now connected to Xbox, we have things like Connect, we have uh, frame readers from cameras. So we can capture things like the infrared frames. We can capture like individual frames of uh, just the normal camera. Uh, built on top of all this is the, uh, the UWP Community Toolkit. So this is a toolkit from some of the uh, work from Microsoft as well as some of the MVPs to create sort of build on top of what we just talked about here. Some new controls, some new animations, et cetera. So I highly recommend going to talk about, look at that. All the code for all the demos I've just done, it's up here on GitHub. Do you have any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. No? Cool. Excellent. Have a good conference. <laughs>